Hey, give us just one second, guys, getting everything uh, set up on his end. Appreciate everybody taking the time to be with us today. Real quick while um, real, real quick while guys getting everything lined up, type in the market that you primarily trade, whether it be stock, futures, options, or forex. Type that in. Just kind of curious to see what the uh, mix of the room. room trades. Looks like Forex, stock options, futures. Looks like we've got lots of options traders in here. All right, you folks hear me now? Hello? Hey, guy, we can hear you. Hey. All right, sorry about that, everybody. I'm, I'm not the most technologically savvy person, so I'm fired up to be here. I don't know if you heard me in the beginning, but I thought Tom did a great job. Makes me want to head on down to Alabama and watch the Alabama Auburn game this year. He and I thought he said some really interesting things and a lot of stuff that I that I happen to agree with. Um, I'm psyched to be with you folks. I actually took I was supposed to be on the half uh, halftime report today at noon, but I bailed on them to be with you folks here today for the next few minutes. So here I am. Um, Trading has to be a vocation, folks. It can't be a hobby. In other words, if you think you're going to do this in your spare time, I think you're going to hurt yourself a great deal. So, you know, there are 800 people or so on this webinar. My sense is that 95% of you folks have day jobs. Sort of get away from that and put in the necessary time that it takes to be a successful trader. But I would say to you folks, you'd be shocked at the amount of time you waste during a typical day, and that's myself included. So. Instead of sending or resending or forwarding on those emails, it says, you know, if you don't send this to 12 people in the next 14 minutes, the sun's going to explode. You know what? Use that time and maybe pull up a chart of something you've been looking at or pull up a news article on something. Natural curiosity takes you a long way, folks. It's shocking how much you learn if you just spend 20 minutes, 30 minutes a day just reading up on things and looking at charts from time to time. So I'll say again. In order to be a successful trader, folks, put the time in that's necessary, and you need the background. You need the foundation to be a good trader, and that all revolves around education. Uh, I see somebody says the audio is rough, and I apologize for that, but I'll, hopefully you can hear me okay. So education is essential. You know, you can't drive a car without knowing how to do it, and I don't think you can trade without knowing how to do it. I think DTI does a great job. And I know at Options Monster, we do a great job as well. Uh, so if we're going to look at charts, I'm going to sort of tell you my two cents on what I think is going on with the marketplace right now. I'm sort of with Tom in that somewhat apocalyptic view of where the world is headed. You know, one thing that I've learned over the years, if it's too good to be true, chances are that is in fact the case. And the fact that the Federal Reserve is throwing the kind of money they are at the problems, and, and in my opinion, it's all to bolster assets, there has to be some end game there. It can't end well. So I think the market can continue to go higher. If you watch Fast Money at all, you'll hear me say all the time, you know, I think the world is on the verge, but that doesn't mean the market can't go higher. And the fact that the S&P sort of is hovering around current levels means to me, and I say it all the time, the market does not give you this long an opportunity to buy the lows, or in this case, to sell the highs. And we've been around this 14 50 level or so in the S&P for quite some time, and I'm hard-pressed to believe that the market's going to give us this much ample time to sell the market up here. So what does that mean? Well, I'm sort of in Tom's camp. I'm more in the 1525 camp in terms of where the S&P is going, but as, as we like to say, you know, 1525, 1540, that's close enough for government work. So that's what I'm looking for, and I think you'll sort of see that happen into this election. And I'm sort of with Tom on this one, although I, I don't really think you can trade an election, folks. And now you're looking at our trade monster. This is our platform. This is what we trade off of. And we're going to pull up an S&P chart now. And if we go back, you know, if we can put up like a 10-year chart and go back a little further, I'll sort, of, I'll sort of show you what I'm looking at. Right now, 14 chart, we have that line there that you've seen, what was Resistance becomes support. You've heard me talk about it on the show. Hopefully, you've all seen the show. 
So again, what was resistance and that was in the form of 1425 becomes support. And it's held there now a couple times over the last month, month and a half. So I'm thinking we're headed probably towards this 15 and a quarter level. And again, if you can pull up a little bit longer term chart in the S&P, you'll see what I'm saying. For those folks out there that believe in the Elliott Wave stuff, a lot of folks think we're about to embark on the fifth wave of what has been a longer term bear market. We shall see. But what I will tell you is, you know, this shoulder we're putting in in terms of the S&P, it's going to be pretty interesting for you folks that follow sort of the head and shoulders pattern. We have the one left shoulder that previous high made a few years ago. Then we have the obvious head that we made before collapsing in March of 2009. And now we have this sort of right shoulder if you're looking at the screen. So I'm sort of of the belief that the market is setting up for a pretty dramatic fall. But again, I'll say doesn't mean the market can't go up in the interim. And I'm still of the belief that we're headed towards this 1525 level. A lot of, lot of noise has been made about this fiscal cliff, and I see somebody talking about it now. My sense is this. It's not the bus you see coming that's going to hit you. It's always the one that you don't see. And although I think the fiscal cliff is a pretty big deal, it sort of reminds me in a lot of ways of Y2K. And for you folks out there that are old enough to remember this, you know, for a year entering 2000, companies spent millions of dollars preparing for Y2K and the subsequent uh, machine outages and, and computer blankouts that were going to happen on January 1st, 2000. Well, that came and went without a hitch, and you know, it was much ado about nothing. And my sense is that the, this fiscal cliff will be similar. Although, listen, I don't underestimate the importance. I think it's probably going to be similar in terms of a lot, you know, much ado about nothing. With my senses, we'll get through it. What we won't get through is this devaluation of the U.S. dollar. So when you're in a global race to zero in the dollar, in, in, in currencies, it, it just can't end well, in my opinion, for equity markets. Again, the markets will be buoyed for a period of time just given the fact that the market is flush with cash and people are in absolute chase mode right now. But when it ends, it's going to end badly. Now, you'll hear people talk about China. So I ask you folks this. If markets are forward-looking, equity markets are forward-looking, what is the Chinese markets telling you at a five-year low? Our equity markets are at a five-year high. The Asian markets, specifically the Chinese markets, are at a five-year low. In my opinion, somebody has to be wrong. And my sense is it's unfortunately probably going to be us. So just keep that in mind. Now, Although we would kill for half of the Chinese growth, 7, 7.5%, we would kill for half of that here, they're decelerating. No matter, what, no matter how you look at it, they're slowing down. Yes, the growth is still tremendous, but folks, they are slowing down. And I think a lot of the rally we've seen here in the U.S. has been predicated on continued double-digit growth in China, which I just don't think we'll see. You, you add on top of that, Europe. Now, folks will say, well, Greece is not a big deal. Spain is not a big deal. And I would agree in, in the individually, none of those countries are that big a deal. But in the aggregate, the, the, 17, or the 17 or 19 countries that make up the Eurozone have a GDP that's about $3 trillion more than us. And they have a population that is larger than ours as well. So if you don't think Europe's a big deal, I just don't think you're paying attention. On top of that, in my opinion. I think you have a structural employment change here in the United States. I think 8%, unfortunately, is probably going to be the norm. And candidly, real unemployment in this country is probably closer to 16%. So depending on the numbers you're looking at, I don't think that's a problem that's going to get better anytime soon, unfortunately. So in a lot of ways, trading and, and understanding how to trade, that could be a nice way to sort of uh, Back up whatever income you have now, folks. So you have to, but, but in order to be a successful trader, I really believe you need the proper education to do so. And I'll say this, in terms of trading, and obviously I can't hear you folks, but I, I know what goes on, you should be able to be right. In other words, your ideas should be able to be right two out of five times or three out of ten times and still be able to make money. Let me, let me repeat that. You should be able to be right two out of five times or three out of ten times and still be able to make money. Now, 
My sense is that most of you folks out there are right 65, 70 percent of the time, but are still managing to lose money. And why is that? It all comes down to discipline. Discipline. Once you put a trade on, that trade should be on autopilot. In other words, you should have done all the work necessary, put the trade on, and then would be able to walk away. In other words, have the stops in place if it hits levels that you should get out on, or if you're long a stock own put protection on the back of it. The, the, the trade itself should be on autopilot. Why do I say that? Well, I'll give you a good example. And we can put up, for example, IBM. Or actually, Google's a really good example now. Uh, but IBM is a, just as good of an example. Now, again, IBM has been a monster stock. If you watch Fast Money, we've talked about it forever. And it's a name I've liked since it was a $90 stock. But if you went in and bought IBM ahead of earnings, let's say 205, 206, 207, thinking, right, this stock's on its way to 250, you may in fact be right. But now here you see it's sub 200. So if you had said, listen, I'm buying IBM at 205, come hell or high water, I'm going to stop out at 200. My upside on the first half of my position is 220. Then that stock is on autopilot. So instead, you say, I'm just going to put a mental stop in. If it gets down to 200, I'm going to get out. Well, here it goes. They report earnings. Stock has an initial bounce maybe, but then it starts selling off. It gets down to that 200 level, and you start playing this game. Well, you know what? It's just on the back of earnings. They weren't that bad. Maybe I'll wait another half an hour and see what happens. Lo and behold, you wait that half hour. Now it's 198. So then you start playing this game. Well, I can't sell it at 198 because I was going to stop out at 200. So I'll just wait some more. So now a stock that you should have been out at at 200 is now 195, and now you start doing this. All your attention is now going to be on IBM. You're going to be laser vision right on the back of IBM to the detriment of everything else. In other words, you're going to bypass all the trading opportunities you have in other stocks because your focus is 100% on IBM, and then you start playing this game. Okay, God, please. If it just gets back to 200, I promise I'll get out and I'll never do this again. Hope should never be an investment thesis. And I know you folks do that, and I'm seeing all the yeses and so trues out there. Again, you should never be in prey mode, folks. You should never be in prey mode. Your trade should be on autopilot. Now, in the, in the case of Google, which just traded down $55, you'd say to me, well, wait a second, guy. That stock gapped down 50 bucks. If I had a stop at 750, I'm probably getting executed at 700. <laughs> and you know what, folks? You're 100% right, which is why it's important to actually know the beta or the way the stock that you're trading actually trades in the real marketplace. A name like General Electric, for example, is a stock that trades like water. It's a stock that I don't necessarily think you need to own put protection on the back of because it trades in a very orderly fashion 99.5% of the time, whereas a stock like Google, as you've seen today and in other instances, is a stock that can gap. So names that can gap like a Google, you know what, folks? It costs you a little bit to have put protection, but if you had 750 puts in Google, guess what? You're out at 750, as opposed to having a stop at 750 in Google, and you're probably getting executed at 700. So understand the stock that you're in and understand the way it trades. And once again, the platform you're seeing right now is our Trade Monster platform. This is the platform that I trade off of. This is the platform that John Nigerian and Pete Nigerian trade off of. And obviously, all the accounts at Option Monster, all the Trade Monster accounts trade off of. It's extraordinarily user friendly. Uh, Barron's has rated us tops for options traders. And frankly, I happen to think we're tops for all types of traders as well. And Nancy, can answer some questions in terms of what it's able to do. But just visually so you see, that's what you're looking at, our Trade Monster platform. Somebody had a question about gold. Let me try to address that real quickly as well. Since the beginning, since the Roman Empire, folks, every fiat currency, every fiat currency has ended disastrously. So you say, well, guy, what is a fiat currency? And basically, it's just a blind faith belief that the currency you hold is backed by the government that's behind it. In other words, my dollar is worth a dollar because the government says it is, right? I mean, that's what a fiat currency is. We believe our dollar is worth a dollar because, you know what, that's what they tell us it's worth. Well, 
you go back to 1919 Germany, and in the in this, I believe it was the winter of 1919-ish, a Deutsche Mark, one Deutsche Mark was let's call it roughly worth about one U.S. dollar, give or take. By spring, one U.S. dollar, the equivalent was about one trillion with a T. Deutsche Mark. So you say, well, wait a second, what does that mean? Well, that's exactly what it means. It was so bad that the German citizens were using the actual paper Deutsche Marks as kindling for their fireplaces to heat their homes. That's how bad it was. Well, you say, well, that can't happen here. And to a certain extent, you're probably right. But we've seen it in Zimbabwe. We've seen it in Argentina. And I think to a certain extent, you can see it here, folks, because we are, regardless of what anybody says, we are in a race to devalue our currency because it makes our goods cheaper and because it helps us get out of this debt problem, candidly. You can sort of lower your currency to get out of the debt problem. It's pretty The problem with that is, the problem with that is it really disenfranchises our population. Things are worth, things, the cost of goods are worth more now. You'll say, well, the inflation reports say the inflation isn't out of control. Listen, I don't know what goes into these inflation reports, but all I know is <clears throat> the things that I go out and buy, be it my special case cereal, my milk to put in that cereal, gasoline has gone up significantly. So, you know, Tom mentioned earlier that median incomes are about the same as they've been over the last, I would say over the last five or ten years, they probably stayed about flat. Well, guess what? The costs associated with living have gone up significantly. So if you don't think our dollar is being devalued, then you're just not paying attention. So how do you trade that? Well, I think what wins to the end is, and I, and I traded gold for 15 years, folks. I traded gold at Drexel Burnham and at Goldman Sachs. And I traded it when it, all it did was go lower. So I am not, by any stretch of the imagination, a gold bug. But I will say this. I think what wins in the end is gold. And I say that because... All the miners, all the all the mining companies have bought back their hedges. They did it roughly at $1,000 an ounce. So all the hedges they put on are off. <laughs> Central banks, which historically have been sellers, are now buyers. And I think they learned their lesson. And some of you folks may have heard this name, but Gordon Brown, I believe it was 2000. Don't quote me on that. But he sold roughly half of England's gold reserves and he did it at about $285 an ounce. And his thought there was, listen, I have a chance to monetize these reserves and to buy the then created euro on the back of it. Well, that's cost the English citizens billions of dollars. The taxpayers in England, billions of dollars for that. Ever since then, central banks, instead of being the sellers of last result, have been the buyers of first resort. And you've seen it with a number of central banks not exclusively, but not limited to the South Koreans, the Chinese. You've seen it all over the globe, the Central Bank of India, and I think you're going to continue to see that. So, again, I'm not, I'm not saying the world is coming to an end, but I am saying that currencies are being devalued globally, and what wins to that is gold. Now, unfortunately, there are days when it's down $30, $40, and it feels like that trade is over, and I understand that, and I know how difficult it is to be in that trade. But I also think that when the dust settles, and that's probably going to be sometime next year, early next year, I think you're going to see gold with a different big figure. When I say that, it means instead of 1700 I think it'll be north, well north of $2,000 an ounce. So the other, the other trade on the back of that, and it's, a, it's something that sort of gets hidden in the weeds, is silver. And I think one of the reasons that silver is underperformed is people view silver as an industrial metal, which to a certain extent that it is, but it's also a speculative tool. And it's also been used, not only was there a gold standard at one point, but silver is actually used to back currencies as well. And I'm not saying that we're going back to any sort of standard, metal standard, gold or silver. What I'm saying is silver does has intrinsic value. And historically, the ratio between gold and silver has been about 15 to 1. So you folks can do the math, and at 15 to 1, and somebody just typed, I think Pete G just said, silver's going to 15 to 1 versus gold. So if you just start doing that math, even if gold goes down $200, it stands to reason that silver still has a lot of room to the upside. So we'll see, folks. Again, I'm, I'll say again, I'm in the camp that, 
you know, I think the, the trade that's going to hurt the most amount of people is an upward move in the S&P. Uh, it defies logic, and the bears out there have been apoplectic because the market just continues to go up on them. But one of the things I like to say is trade the market that's in front of you. Um, and don't trade the one you're wishing for. You can make money from this market on the long side and the short side. Uh, one of my sons plays hockey, and I'll say this, folks. In hockey, you need to know how to skate forwards as well as backwards. Forwards as well as backwards to be a successful hockey player. Well, in the marketplace, to be a successful trader, you have to be able to make money on the long side and the short side. And to be honest with you, and Tom could speak to this, markets go down faster than they go up. So typically, you make money faster on the short side of things. I think the mistake people make and the mistake that uh, commentators make is they like to use adjectives like good and bad when describing the marketplace. You shouldn't use the word good or bad when describing the marketplace. It's up or down. When you get through, I think when you understand that up or down, it makes it a lot easier. It shouldn't be a good day because the market went up, and it shouldn't necessarily be a bad day when the market goes down. Again, as traders, you should be able to be successful on both sides. So somebody just said, Randy just said you're misinformed, but I won't argue with him. I'm trying to see what Randy was speaking to. Maybe he can uh, ask me the question uh, online. And I'll take a couple questions online in the last couple minutes we had. Oh, Randy said not about your comments, guys. Sorry about that, Randy. So. Uh, you know, any questions you want to type, uh, I'd be more than happy to answer. Uh, somebody just said, what's your take on Apple's current pullback? Um, here's the thing about Apple. I'm going to be careful about this because I understand how passionate people are about Apple. But to me, they're just letters and numbers, okay? They're just letters and numbers. But when I was a kid, uh, this is now, I'm 48 years old, so when I was in high school, there was one company that dominated the landscape. You couldn't turn around without bumping into one of their products. Let's see if anybody knows the name of that company. I'll wait for a couple of people. It wasn't Nike. <coughs> there you go. Scott just put it in. It was Sony. You couldn't turn around without Sony being in your face, right? Sony was absolutely taking over the world. Well, look at Sony now, folks. Sony, Sony is an afterthought. So people will say, well, it can't happen to Apple because Apple has their the Apple ecosystem. Okay, that's fine. And I'm sure the same argument was made about Sony some 30 years ago, but I'll say this. When Apple products become ubiquitous or when the cool factor goes away, which it will, what's going to happen to Apple? And I'm not saying it's going to happen, but it's something you need to, you absolutely need to ask that question. So, I get more hate mail. As a matter of fact, the only hate mail I get is when I say something that's even construed as negative about Apple. I, 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 I you know, candidly, I, I have no great passion one way or another. I have their phones, but that's just about it. So it doesn't do it for me. But it's amazing how, um, for lack of a better term, brainwashed people have become to the Apple products. A little scary, frankly. So it's just again something to think of. So listen, somebody just said Amazon has a huge PE ratio, and it absolutely has. What's working in Amazon's favor, by the way, JJ, is that their margins have been improving. What scares me about Amazon here at 255 or so is you could potentially have a monster double top from a few years ago, just something to keep in mind. And if those margins in, in Amazon contract in any way, yeah, I think you have to look out on the downside. So valuation's been a concern for that stock that's gone up in, in the wake of that. And I don't think there's any reason to believe it can't continue to, but just keep an eye on margins near their next release. So that's about all my time, folks. I appreciate it. Uh, again, that was our Trade Monster platform that you've seen everything on. I encourage you folks to the extent you're looking for a new trading platform to check out ours. I thank the 800 or so of you that have been on. To uh, Thanks for spending your time with us. I know it's a time out of your day, and I truly appreciate it. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to some of our folks, and they're going to speak about some of the offers we have. Tom, I appreciate your time. Morgan as well. And uh, I'm going to pass the mic over. And we're going to talk about a special offer we have now.